For our last plenary presentation of the day, uh, we are privileged to hear from two longtime ECHO friends. Angela Boss was an ECHO intern and has worked with uh, sister organizations. Most recently, now she is working with World Renew uh, and is working on development projects uh, over the years in about 19 countries around the world. Uh, Stefan Lutz uh, did an extended study project here at ECHO some years ago. He has spent the last 14 years working primarily in Kenya. And both Stefan and Angela have a wealth of experience in the area of conservation agriculture. And I just have to tell you, it, uh, I, I love the title that they've given to their talk, The Cheers and Challenges of Conservation Agriculture Programs. And so we are going to hear from them not only the positive results, but some of the challenges and barriers that they have faced and worked to overcome in promoting the adoption of CA practices. So please join me in welcoming Angela Boss and Stefan Lutz. Thank you, David. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, World Renew may be a new name for you. We are the uh, relief and development arm of the Christian Reformed Church in North America, and we were formerly known by a long acronym, CRWRC, uh, but you can now call us World Renew, which is a little bit easier. So Stefan and I are going to talk about the cheers and challenges of conservation agriculture programs implemented with small-scale farmers. And just by way of introduction, what are the issues that we are working with? Um, we're, we're going to primarily focus on our experience in East and Southern Africa. So the current conditions that we are facing uh, with our farmers are declining soil fertility, heavy tillage, changing weather patterns, droughts and floods, as Sarah spoke about, declining yields, and little to no fallow period being practiced, a lack of crop diversity, um, poor adherence to those good agronomic practices, and in many places also seeing an undue burden of labor on women. So I'm not going to go into all of the wonderful things about conservation agriculture, why we are using conservation agriculture in particular, um, because we just don't have enough time, and it could take us all day to do that with you. But it is important that we work off a common definition. So the definition that we work by is the one provided by the Food and Agriculture Organization. Conservation agriculture is an approach to managing agroecosystems for improved and sustained productivity, increased profits and food security, while preserving and enhancing the resource base and the environment. And CA is characterized by these three linked principles. Continuous minimum mechanical soil disturbance, in other words, minimum tillage, permanent organic soil cover, and the diversification of crop species grown either in rotation or in association. And I should say that these three principles are predicated on good agronomic practices. So you have to have that base of good agronomic practice. And on top of that are these three key principles. And I, I want to emphasize principles, because I think the principles are what is important and what we are finding we need to most emphasize with the partners and the farmers that we work with. So CA principles are differentiated from the practices. The principles really underline why. Why are we doing these things? What is happening on our farm? What are the things we are working towards? So the first, and practices then, are how. How do we go about implementing that principle on our farm? And they are all highly context dependent. My farm, my community is different from your farm and your community and may require a different set of practices. But we're all working off the same set of principles. So that first principle of minimizing tillage could look like using planting basins, using permanent ridges, using oxen, using jab planters. There's different practices that can get at minimizing tillage. Similarly, maximizing soil cover. There are different practices associated with 
maximizing soil cover. This could be importing mulch from off-farm. This could be using crop residues. It could be green manure cover crops. It could be integrating trees through agroforestry systems. There's more than one way to maximize soil cover. The third principle, diversifying crop associations and rotations. Again, more than one practice to get at this principle. Traditional crop rotation, cereal legume interplanting, many other practices associated with these three. Here you see maize interplanted with pigeon pea, and a, an example of crop association, interplanting. So altogether we get this package, we get this set of practices that accomplish those three principles. They're going to be different in every context. And I make this point because what we are finding with many of our partners, and we work primarily through partner organizations, is that most of them have been trained on conservation agriculture with a specific set of practices. And there's been a number of results from that. In particular, the farmers that we work with, the partners that we work with, have been trained on farming God's way. And so I want to just make clear some of the distinctions between when we talk about farming God's way and when we talk about conservation agriculture. Farming God's way, in our experience, and this, isn't, uh, this is just based on our partner's experience, it's, it's different, it may not be what farming God's way's intention is, um, but it's a focus on the six biblical keys, the biblical reasons for farming and the practices that they um, are, are introducing. It's usually set out as a prescribed set of practices for dry land farming, uh, God's blanket, importing mulch, having 100% cover. It's hoe-based, um, emphasizing planting basins. Um, they emphasize crop rotation rather than interplanting. They use a very rigid plant spacing and it's generally organic, but not always. Conversely, for conservation agriculture, we focus on the three principles, the why, without a prescribed set of practices. Instead, encouraging farmer experimentation, innovation, adaptation to each individual farm context. And using a wide variety of technologies, including fertilizer and herbicides, where appropriate. Farming God's way, though, is CA. It is following the principles of conservation agriculture. So it has been a very good starting point for smallholder farmers and for our partners. And the biblical principles of farming God's way have been very important for our partner organizations and the integration of creation care. And this can be put into programs that are emphasizing the principles of CA rather than the practices of CA. So I want to move to uh, an example of conservation agriculture in eastern Zambia. This is with the Reformed Church of Zambia, working in the districts of Kitete and Chipata. These areas are characterized by low rainfall, poor soils, recurring drought. Um, in this case, Reformed Church started with farming God's way and started with promotion of the hoe-based um, system of minimum tillage. Our partners focused on organic production. They discouraged the use of chemicals and fertilizers. And in the end, uh, after a number of years, what we were finding was low adoption of the practices and generally no more than a quarter acre of land underneath those practices promoted by Farming God's Way. We also found um, that there was generally partial adoption of the three principles. So usually, farmers were able to accomplish minimum tillage, they were able to accomplish some kind of diversification, but keeping a permanent soil cover did not happen. They missed out on the mulch piece. And farmers tended to take an all or nothing approach. Either they could do the set of practices, or they didn't do them at all. So on a three acre parcel, farmers would do a quarter acre at most, even after several years, of the CA practices. On the other rest of their acreage, they went back to the traditional farming, used fertilizer. Where they had ox, they used oxen. So it was this all or nothing approach. And we wanted to know why. There was also a high labor burden with this initial form of CA, especially with the mulch and with the basins. And this 
tended to put an undue burden of labor on women. And again, uh, the partner focused on organic production, which um, we found to be that they, but they still use fertilizer on the other part of their land, which was interesting. So we did an evaluation uh, two years ago to look at the constraints that farmers were facing in adopting conservation agriculture. And one of the first things that came up was a limited supply of manure, which, which limited their ability to scale up beyond a quarter an acre. Because their focus was using manure, compost, in those basins, once the supply of manure ran out, there was no more, CA wasn't happening anymore. And, and just to, to tell you, in the three years of that project, the price of an ox cart of manure went up three times. So if you were also a widow or someone without means, without a lot of animals, your ability to purchase manure also went down as the demand went up. Um, there were labor constraints when using a hoe, burning and livestock press pressure on the mulch was a constraint because they used crop uh, residues as the mulch. Um, and they, they would use grass from around and collecting that after someone had burned was a big issue, and the burning was not primarily for land preparation. The burning in this part of Zambia is for mice collection. It's a, an important protein source in that area. Um, and then weed pressure, which also became um, a heavy gender issue because mostly women were the ones who were doing that weeding, and it was a huge burden on their time. But there were some factors, and are some factors in Zambia that make conservation agriculture um, very possible. There are some drivers of adoption present. CA works. It increases yield. It increases soil moisture. And for farmers, especially farmers in, in Katete facing a drought, if you do traditional practice and you do CA, even two of the three principles of CA, you will get a yield in a drought year where your traditional fields will not. So people know this works. There's special technology that has been developed in Zambia to facilitate CA, the chaka hoe. It's a hoe that was developed in Zambia that's heavier, wider, and makes just the perfect planting basin. So availability of those everywhere uh, helps, as well as the Magoi Ripper. The Ripper has really um, been able to scale up CA, but it requires promotion and the use of animal traction. There's a supportive policy environment in Zambia, from the top levels of government, through local government, through extension, um, through the seed companies, through other organizations promoting conservation agriculture. There is not a place you can go in this part of Zambia that you don't see a sign on the highway, from billboards to little tiny signs promoting that CA is good, you should do this. There's constant messaging that this is a good thing. This is sensitive. So we took those results from the evaluation and put them back into the program. And here's what we needed to do. We needed to encourage farmer innovation and experimentation. Farmers needed to be encouraged and allowed to experiment with the practices once they understood why we needed to do those principles. So we went back to the foundations of why. Why are we doing this? And they figured out the how. We used a lead farmer model, farmers who were already taking the risk and experimenting with those principles on their own. We encouraged the continuation of manure and compost, but also encouraged farmers to add in fertilizer. They have access to fertilizer in this part of the country, um, and they're already using it, but in, in, so then teaching about microdosing and using fertilizer as part of the system. We did training on the use of the ripper. We um, talked about the promotion of intercropping, they were getting messages that this is wrong, this isn't going to work. So we said, yeah, there are some, here is the benefits and here are the disadvantages to intercropping. You make the decision for yourself. And that diversification is what was attracting farmers, diversifying their risk. We also did a lot of training on the use of green manure cover crops, deciding which ones to use, what benefits are you looking for, which ones are most appropriate. You choose how to use this. And then um, not making herb herbicide use taboo. Herbicides have a place. We talked about the appropriate use of herbicides. 
how to apply them appropriately, when to apply them. Um, and, and they've been helpful in this context. And again, I, I say this is a contextualized approach. It doesn't work and isn't appropriate for everywhere. So this is an example of the ripper, the Magoy ripper. Um, they're quite affordable. They, they rip a line through the subsoil and then you amend that line with fertilizer or manure, plant your seeds in there. Uh, you can do so many more acres with the ripper than you ever can do with one family in a hoe. We have seen um, a, up to a tenfold increase in land under minimum tillage with the use of the ripper. This I wanted to just point out was another learning for us in Zambia. This was a farmer who did a demonstration on his plot. These two crops were planted at the very same time. This is maize, one side they used manure, one side they just used fertilizer. And for this farmer, it was clear, and this was, this was the drought of last year, uh, that using manure had a definite advantage, particularly that soil organic matter and the water holding ability of this very sandy soil was improved with this uh, manure application. On the fertilizer side, this, this, wasn't gonna, this wasn't gonna be a crop that was going to bear any fruit this year. So in this case, he said, yeah, next year, I'm gonna combine the fertilizer with the green manure cover crop. I need to increase the organic matter on the fertilizer side. I now see that. Fertilizer alone is not going to help me. This manure side, yeah, we learned something through this demonstration, this experiment. So farmer experimentation is really critical. Which brings me to um, my second example, a short example of, from uh, Mozambique. So we're implementing a program in Mozambique in Nyasa province, which is in northern Mozambique. Um, some of it's along the Lake Malawi. Other parts are, are up from the lake. It's, they're working in a huge area. No single agroecological zone. It is very complicated and complex. We're also working with partner staff who are farmers. They've had no formal training. And this area, unlike Zambia, has really good rainfall. Drought is not their problem, but they have very poor soil fertility. And they do not use good agronomic practices, particularly improper spacing and improper density. So you will find five to seven maize plants in one little spot and very close by five to seven more. And in this case, the partner also started with Farming God's Way training. They went to Malawi to a very different context and were trained and they learned about basins, so they brought this back. They also learned that mulch is grass, because in many parts of dry land Africa, the only thing you can cut for mulch is grass. But in this part of Mozambique, there's a lot of green stuff that can be cut. There are a lot of tree leaves that can be cut, and what happened was they heard one set of practices and applied that blanket across the area they were working. So when you went to a field and you said, Where why aren't you using mulch? And you look around, you're like, goodness, there's everything here you could use for mulch. Oh, we don't have any grass. Well, is mulch only grass? Well, yes, that's what we learned. Oh boy, we need to go back to what, what soil cover is. It can be anything, organic matter, organic material. So when they did this first demonstration, they didn't have much mulch, the basins flooded. Uh, because they had plenty of rainfall, and they kept getting plenty of rainfall. There is also a really strong tradition in this area of ridging and intercropping. And this was exciting for me. This is the first place I've ever been to that I have seen indigenous communities planting makuna and consuming makuna. Uh, don't, don't know the history. The, most of the farmers in that area are very young. They're in their 20s. They've, they have grown up eating makuna, but we don't know where it got introduced, why, but they, they do it well. They boil that thing five times and dump out the water five times, and it is a food security strategy for the community. They know that it helps improve their soil, but they're not exactly sure what the best way of using it to improve their soil is. So we've got this wonderful base to start from. They're also naturally intercropping with pigeon pea. Pigeon pea and maize in the same row um, and then using cow pee to a, to a small extent. But there's also a strong fear in the area that mulch will bring termites, and termites will eat 
the crop. So, our strategy in this area is to again go back to emphasizing why. Why are we doing the things that we're doing, rather than how to do them? It's less important for me to give uh, an extension worker training in that area on exact spacing density for a maize pigeon pea intercrop than to help that person understand why we're interplanting maize and pigeon pea. How do you decide how to space plants rather than just telling someone, oh, I would do it this way. The farmer groups are now experimenting and designing their own experiments. So what we're doing is working with the extension officers to plan out a good experiment, to work on the why, the principles. They are then taking those principles and working with farmer groups to design their own experiment plan. So just, in, uh, just last month, 14 extension agents and myself sat around and we went through all these principles, went through the why, and then it was their job to create a drawing of how they were going to do it. So the bottom piece is, is they had to draw out what their demonstration of current practice will look like. What is current practice? So this is uh, someone's representation of a giant ridge. They're very high with um, cassava in one and manioc er, and uh, maize in another. And then they had to draw, what's our ex new experiment going to look like? And here they drew out what the new experiment was going to look like. Um, this is what we are going to try. And then we critiqued each other. Why this spacing? What was your thinking behind this? So now they've all gone out and are working with farmer groups to design experiments on a small scale. These are 10 by 10 or 20 by 10 meter plots where they will then evaluate over the year, how is this working? Is this something I want to try on my own land? But the emphasis is on those three principles. Why are we doing this? Um, and we're also trying to build on those good agronomic practices, spacing and plant density are all part of this, and building on traditional systems with the incorporation of minimum tillage. So in this case, it will look, likely look more like permanent ridges rather than flat ground with basins. And eventually, as things progress, I envision seeing the ridges starting to disappear, but starting slowly, and building off of what's already there, those indigenous systems that exist. So from Mozambique, we're going to um, fly over to Nairobi. Kenya, and Stefan. All right, good morning, everyone. Should I use this, or oh, is it okay here? Um, I'm wondering why you stood here, because I think I can stand here and still see the, but maybe. <laughs> but I'll do the same. I think it's a great, is this better, or is it? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. And I think the cameraman will have a little bit of work to do with me as well. So anyways, good to be here. Um, thank, thank you, Angela, for presenting on uh, ex experience from Mozambique and Zambia. As she mentioned, I would like to also share a little bit about northern, I mean, northern a part of there, which is Eastern Africa, and especially Kenya. Now, World Renew um, works not only in uh, Kenya. We also have some CA programming in Uganda and Tanzania. But I thought because of time, and I have much more experience in Kenya, I thought I'd share more from the Kenyan side. Now, there's going to be some overlap, because uh, challenges and cheers from Zambia and Mozambique are going to be very similar, so you might hear some repetition, but you might learn some new things as well. So one of the things that Angela already mentioned, I'm going to go very quickly, is that we have an issue of recurrent drought and flooding, nothing new. There's low crop yields, there's degraded environment, uh, degraded soils, there's poverty, and this produces chronic food insecurity, as everybody knows. And at the same time, we have a, a kind of a cyclical pattern of emergency food relief and dependency that's happening. Um, and we see drought, we see uh, animals dying, we uh, see much more increasingly um, uh, plants also dying. In Kenya, we've done some uh, studies or just some analysis that before, in the 70s, we usually got a drought or a bad, a bad drought every 10 years. In the 80s, that became every five years, and in the 90s, and now we're seeing almost every three years, just in general. I'm not saying that that's scientific data, but that we're seeing more 
droughts and more extreme weather patterns happening, whether drought or flooding. Uh, at the moment, uh, I hear Kenya is getting quite a bit of rain, so we're, um, we're having, uh, we might have some issues there. The other bigger thing is, of course, that uh, ECHO and a lot of us are very uh, interested in is the, the aspect of soil degradation. This is a study from the 90s, so it's a little outdated. But uh, I think even 20 years later, we might not see very much difference, where we see that 93% of the land in Kenya is degraded in some form or an of another. Uh, a lot of it is light deg degradation, uh, some moderate 22%, some severe, and some very severe. Uh, the bottom line is that we have an issue of soil degradation happening not only in Kenya, but Africa and uh, possibly worldwide. Now in Kenya, um, we have currently three intervention areas, geographic areas. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see in the black. And Nairobi is just below that, that red uh, bigger dot, um, bigger area. And so our CA programming has been not more than an hour outside of Nairobi in what we call the peri-urban areas of Nairobi. And it wasn't as intentional as it just happened to be that way. Uh, but in the near future, we will be expanding our work given the success, and of course we also had challenges, but given the success of what we're seeing, as Angela mentioned, uh, we're seeing an increased uh, excitement, we're seeing increased crop, we're seeing, um, hopefully we'll see increased uh, even soil fertility um, over the years, but that will be a gradual movement. So we'll be in Western Kenya, expanding to Western Kenya, to Rift Valley, uh, we're expanding some of the work in central Kenya, and we'll also be going to eastern Kenya. And I wouldn't be surprised that we will also be uh, working in coastal Kenya. These are the areas where we actually work as World Renew in Kenya. Um, it is pretty sensitive. Right? <laughs> and uh, World Renew, as Angela mentioned as well, we work through church partnerships. Um, so it's really, we don't implement our programs ourselves. But we, we use, uh, we partner, would be a better word, with relief and development arm of the Anglican Church of Kenya, specifically in, in Kenya and Uganda. It would be the Pentecostal Church in uh, Tanzania, uh, other churches. So it's, it's really a partnering and building the capacity, organizational capacity of these partners so they implement programs, not just for now, but for uh, future uh, years to come. So it's a kind of a sustainable model of working through partnerships. This is an example of a plot in central Kenya, uh, I would say about an hour outside of Nairobi, north of Nairobi, near the Thika area, for some of you who know Kenya, uh, in Moranga County. And here you can see maize residue being used by the farmer um, to, after they, they harvested the, the maize and just basically put it on the, on the they leave it on the, on the, on the soil. Luckily, this area, or not luckily, but the, the, the reality is this area doesn't have competition with animals that much, so they can do that. In other areas, and I'll talk more later, is there's going to be a competition for animal feed. Uh, but here, farmers are using maize stalks. They're using, uh, if you see the tree on the back, the big tree that stands out, that's a Gervelia robusta, uh, one of the more common species we see in central Kenya that is... Uh, become a very good agroforestry tree for conservation agriculture. It sheds its leaves, and it's, it's been, uh, people really like it. It grows very fast. Uh, and of course, we have the bananas and others. Sorry. This is a, an example of a champion farmer. Uh, in Kenya, we started, the model we've used is working through champion farmers. And basically, these champion farmers who have adopted uh, conservation agriculture, they will now reach out to at least three or other, four other uh, farmers. So that's kind of the model we're experimenting. We're not saying that's what you should be doing, but we thought that would be a good approach, and not just we, but the partner and even the community was involved in that decision. So this is a champion farmer, uh, also not too far from Nairobi, in central Kenya, growing potatoes. Now, in between these potatoes, you're gonna see some kales, but I don't know if you notice on your left, uh, from, your, from, where you're, from the picture, and you're right if you see a difference. And he basically said, I, I don't believe this CA thing. Can I, I'm, I'm gonna try it out. So he planted a conventional plot the way he was doing potatoes on the left, and then he tried out CA on the right. 
And I think you can see the difference just in vegetative growth. Uh, I've been into that farm very often. The soil is very loose. Uh, the moisture content is higher, especially after it hasn't rained for a while. Uh, you see the potato flowering already before the other one hasn't even flowered. So it, it's, there was an obvious difference. And uh, the farmer was so excited, he's now uh, trying to convert his old, I think it's about four acres land to uh, CA, but he needed to go through that. And that's very important. Uh, farmers should be experimenting. They should be doing their own trials. Here's another photo of that same plot. I don't know if you see some of the mulching. The, he's mulching about one feet, which is quite a lot. Um, but is, even if it doesn't rain there for, let's say, three weeks or a month, he will still get a pretty good harvest because uh, soil moisture retention capacity and also the uh, soil moisture will be stored in the soil and there's very little uh, evaporation that will happen. But not only the, 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 the being able to grow under uh, you know, no rainfall conditions or erratic conditions, but also the quality of the product is another thing we're realizing. If you look at these potatoes, they were quite large uh, and people are actually paying more money for better potatoes. So the farmers who are doing CA are getting better income just because uh, middlemen, which is not always the best, uh, but going to the market, at the market itself, people are paying more money for the same potato than a conventional. Now, some observations for, uh, from an empowered community. I, uh, some of you know me, uh, know me better. Uh, I hesitate to... Um, bring out a strategy or a new crop without involving uh, some of the bigger picture items or processes in community development, because those are really that will make and break in my understanding and my uh, knowledge and my experience in community development. So I thought I'd share a little bit about why it is important that as we promote an agricultural development strategy like CA, as we promote uh, you know, any other, like Amaranth, as I mentioned the other night, we need to be very keen on making sure the community comes along in this process anywhere we go in the world. So one of the things that we have, uh, we have seen uh, from an empowered community that it brings out their issues without fear and implement what they have learned. They identify, mobilize, and utilize their local resources to their fullest extent. They organize themselves and work together to achieve their own community plans. Notice the own. They're confident to speaking out against injustice whenever they are encountered. We have an example of an area where we're promoting conservation agriculture, where it's a, it's a mango producing area. And the middlemen were coming and buying the mango at a very low price. And the community, through their confidence, through their um, empowerment that they, have, they, that they have received or they, they have, um, are now saying, we're not buying any mangoes below eight shillings, even though before they were selling at three shillings a mango. So that's more than double, almost triple, and that's now the norm in that area. So they're getting triple the income just because they dealt with an injustice of a low price from the middlemen, and they got together, and they, uh, there's a story about that, a very neat story. Holding themselves and stakeholders involved mutually accountable. There's always a mutual, mutual accountability. We as outsiders often want accountability from the communities and from the projects, but I think they also need to hold us accountable because we do mistakes very often. So it's very important that there's a mutual trust and mutual accountability as we do community development, um, as we facilitate processes, let's put it that way. So we use these tools as World Renew, and it's become a very standard tool globally. Uh, other than the organizational capacity building and other tools that we use um, and appreciative inquiry is PRA. And PRA has been a tool that's been out there for very long. So it's nothing new to most of you. But I don't see it very often being practiced uh, and almost uh, taken a, as an attitude. A tool is only effective if it becomes an attitude. So I feel like the whole participatory thing should be more of an attitudinal thing than it should be a tool. Uh, and here, the farmers in, in group in Western Kenya uh, are identifying crops, for example. This was a tool we used uh, uh, not that long ago to, to identify uh, the crops they grow, and they prioritize them as well 
according to yield, taste, market, and other criteria that they themselves identify. So by these processes, we are figuring out what are some of what are some of the crops that they like to grow, what are some of the crops they use, and what are some of the crops that sell well, and what are some of the crops that taste well. Uh, so you get a lot of information um, just from being with them and facilitating some of these processes. Here's another focus group discussion uh, tool and uh, we use. This is a women's group in coastal Kenya. And these discussions help outsiders understand the local context better and at the same time give an opportunity for community members to express themselves. So often we come with our own ideas, we come with our own pre, uh, predetermined almost uh, plan on what we should do, but uh, we don't give time uh, and allow and give the space and safety for communities to speak out. This is another example, sorry I'm veering off, but I, I think I want to make a point here that, that will come all together at the end, but this is a, a water pan that we have, a lot of, we've ex excavated, uh, or communities have excavated a lot of these water pans in the past, also in coastal Kenya, and the point here is that these communities uh, are doing it all by themselves, and it takes one month to two months, actually almost to three months to do it. Now, we could hire a machine or somebody else to come in and do it for them. But we have realized that often uh, it is better that communities do it themselves. Even though it takes longer, there is uh, dignity building happening. Uh, and when I go back, when you go back to some of these places even now, let's say 10 years after they build them, they're still using them. People are, they own them. This is their dam. It's not somebody else built it for them. Uh, so this is, that's um, what I was talking about. Now, going back to CA, uh, some of the cheers and challenges. Uh, some of the cheers that we're seeing, in, especially from the Kenyan perspective, and they were overlapped with Southern Africa, is that the CA plots are most likely to produce some harvest, especially in erratic rainfall seasons, compared to traditional planted plots. So we're going to get something out of a plot even though the rainfall or there's, um, there's low rainfall, erratic rainfall happening. CA plots produce better yield in general and the quality of the crops, as I mentioned uh, earlier with potatoes, which fetch a better price on the market. CA saves time and farmers are able to use that time to do other things such as raise animals, do value addition, or even go for a temporary job. So there's a time saving component in CA that, that we're realizing. CA uses local resources and is in general profitable. When combined with some form of irrigation, attracting youth back into farming. This is really exciting. In Kenya, we have a lot of youth, especially in central Kenya, who are very, who are disillusioned, are idle, and once they try CA, especially with some higher value gardens, um, vegetable and fruit gardens, uh, they're actually coming back into farming. They said, we didn't know farming was this profitable. We want to be in this. So I think there's a lot of potential uh, bringing back youth into farming, uh, not only in Kenya, but in other places. And we're getting a sense of the potential for that. And as Angela mentioned, when used with cover crop systems, in Kenya, especially the lab lab bean, because it is eaten quite widely in central Kenya, so it fertilizes the soil, it's a cover crop, and they like the taste of it. That's a win-win situation right there. Overall, so the adoption of Lab Lab was very, was already there, so it was very easy. Now in other parts of Kenya, it's a bit more difficult, uh, but CA can provide sufficient ground cover and improve soil fertility over time and offer a meal, a very nutritious meal for that matter. Lab Lab bean is a very uh, high protein, nutritious crop to eat. Now, challenges. Uh, adopting CA requires a behavior change, all right? especially not tilling the soil and keeping the ground covered all the time. We realize that people are just, a lot of people are just not there yet on tilling the soil. They've done it for so many years and it's, it's been hard. And even putting mulch on the soil. It looks cleaner when sometimes you don't have mulch on the soil. In Eastern Kenya, they'll burn the residue. It looks better. So you can see it's a behavior change that needs to happen. 
uh, that it will take time. So there is no quick fix to this. Mulch material needed for CA is a limiting factor in expanding CA plots. The mulch often competes with animal feed and especially drier agropastoralist areas. We work in areas uh, who are both pastoralist and uh, sedimentary uh, and are, are growing crops. Uh, and in these areas, it's always the question, should I use the mulch for my field or should I give it to the animal? So th those are some of the things where even green cover manure uh, trees, as Angela mentioned, can also help with providing this mulch material for both field and for animals. And lastly, there's a lack of overall technical CA support available for expanding CA work in Kenya. Uh, sounds like in Southern Africa, the support is uh, more advanced or there's more of it. But in Kenya, we're pretty much starting out uh, in terms of equipment, research, advocacy work, but we hope that will change with time. Now, I have five more minutes. On top of the CA tiers and challenges, these are some observations that I've made over the, over the last three to four years on complementary interventions that will help with the CA promotion. Actually, animal husbandry, uh, especially keeping indigenous poultry, goats, rabbits, and bees, uh, together with promotion of CA has been very beneficial. Water and irrigation, again, I mentioned the youth. When you bring in a component of not only CA, but you bring in drip irrigation for high value crops, uh, we're seeing a lot of um, positive results from that. Community participation, I, ne I never underestimate, don't underestimate the community participation, ownership, and adoption of this technology. Because when there's ownership, people are so excited about not only their, what they have done, but they now go out to other areas and share that excitement. Uh, and that in itself is, a, for me, a very com a key component of transformation when a community is so excited, has been blessed by what they have received, what they are doing, that they go to other communities and share that same excitement. Just some pictures here, beekeeping. Uh, these are all uh, activities that we do together with CA. Uh, some rabbit keeping, uh, poultry keeping, and we also have some goat, both dairy and meat goat keeping. Farm exposure visits and practical on-farm trainings have been important components in, in promoting CA. So as we share, uh, as we train in classroom, uh, we also need to be practicing outside, doing, the, doing all these principles um, um, with the farmers. Uh, so make it a very practical, applicable um, training. Uh, and farm exposure visits is all, almost sometimes a first eye-opener for farmers, going from one area to the other to see what is happening. And this is our potato model farmer that has received so many farmers from other areas just to show um, uh, what he's doing. And he's, every time I go, there's a pride in him, and there's like, this is the best thing that could have happened to me. And uh, so that, that excitement sometimes goes over to others. Using homemade compost and cover crops like lab lab bean, like I mentioned earlier, increases soil cover and soil fertility. Some of you might recognize uh, Neil Miller uh, on the right there. Neil has been very helpful in Eastern Africa. Um, he's a conservation agriculture technical officer, and he comes and trains and helps, supports, listens, learns. Uh, it's been really good working with him. Uh, I believe some of you might know him in this room. Now, the other one, this is a, Thanks to Roland Bunch, this is a training that he did, and he brought in this, I don't know if you can see it, but basically uh, it's, it's the experience we have so far on what cover crops are best for Kenya. And we have those over 1,500 meters and those under 1,500 meters. So we are realizing up to now that the best, and we work under 1,500 meters, is that the, uh, the best cover crops that we are identifying are lab lab beans, the jack bean, and the, uh, uh, let's see, and the, and the um, muhuna as well. And then good, that's excellent, um, and good uh, would be the vigna species, both the green grams and the cowpeas. And then we have the poor, not so great, uh, we have the um, the common bean, Fasulas vulgaris, and then we have some peanuts and even the pigeon pea. From my experience, 
uh, in central Kenya, jack bean. I haven't seen much jack bean and mukuna, probably because it can't be eaten, but the lab lab has been overwhelmingly the best cover crop that even though I hear that jack bean fixes more nitrogen than, than lab lab. And also the pigeon pea in eastern, in eastern Kenya has been quite uh, adopted. Therefore, start small plots and expand from there. Adapt CA technology to local farming systems. Pay attention to fertility needs of crops. Don't introduce too many things at once. Go slow, you might confuse people. Identify good green manure crops that benefit the soil and that people and animals can eat. Okay, and identify them always together with the community. Use farmers to train other farmers. This is just a summary. Eh? Take into account the needs of livestock, not just crops. Finally, I'd like to leave you with this quote, which is, uh, I believe, summarizes our talk as, uh, Rather than being a fixed technology to be adopted in blueprint-like fashion, CA should be seen as a set of sound agricultural principles and practices that can be applied either individually or together based on resource availability and other factors. For this reason, farmers are encouraged to experiment with the methods and to evaluate the results for themselves. All right. This is taken from a Cornell website, which I, powerful message, uh, powerful, basically saying we, we need to let, we, we're still not, we have a lot to learn, uh, and we need to let farmers experiment and continue experimenting, and, and even as ECHO, I would encourage you and us all to continue sharing best practices on CA in the years to come and so that we, we grow in this together, we learn in this together, and not say we have the answers, and I'm not saying we do, some people, but that this, this is a progress, this is a journey that we're doing, just as, as um, ECHO did with Moringa and other plants, and I hope that ECHO takes this on as one of the journeys uh, for us to uh, walk in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>